Good evening, everybody. Brian Newbert here from goldenblack.com. Uh, following Purdue's 28 to 10 loss to Nebraska in Ross Aid Stadium, I am sitting in this week as our quote unquote host for Alan Karpik, who we're going to leave overnight in his cell so he can think about what he did. Uh, thank you to the uh, Purdue Union Club Hotel, as always, for your support. We hope you had a, a boisterous and prosperous weekend here on Homecoming at Purdue. I am here with my colleagues, my distinguished Hall of Fame caliber colleagues, Stetler and Waldorf, uh, Tom Dean Hart, and Mike Carmen. Uh, we are here to talk about, much to your chagrin, uh, Purdue's 28 to 10 loss once again to Nebraska on homecoming. Uh, Tom, I'm going to start with you. Uh, mm -hmm. You're pretty close to this in terms of the day-to-day -day coverage. Are you seeing a team that just hasn't found itself yet, or are you just seeing a team that just doesn't have it? Maybe both. It certainly hasn't found itself yet, Brian. I guess my question is, will it find itself? I think that's the question Purdue fans have floating around their head. Now, will this team ever get on track, Brian? I asked Ryan some questions along those lines, and and uh, you never get any real clear clear cut, you know, answers to those type of questions in the post game aftermath. But where do you start with the questions? And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm going to start with the offense. And uh, boy, in July and August, I thought that was going to be the strength of this team. And I know there's a couple receivers out, but my goodness, I think it's 38 points the last three games they've scored. Whoever watched the game knows the issues, obviously. Uh, the run game was non-existent today. I thought they could hang their hat on that. Offensive line was porous. Hudson Card was sacked five times under constant duress, it seemed like. Passing game showed a little bit more life. But incredibly, Hudson Card threw his third pick six in three weeks. That must be some type of a record. So on and on the questions pour out of your head, right, guys? Purdue's one and three coming out of September, right? This was the critical month to set up the rest of the season. And then they failed. Now they got to go to Wisconsin. They got to go to Illinois. And they've got Oregon at home on a Friday night. I think it's fair to ask this question, guys. We will Purdue win another game this year. Mike Carmen, on that note, I'm going to go to you. You <laughs> sat with me for many, many years through many, many horrible Purdue football games. You are also a Bears fan, so you have tremendous perspective on struggling. Well, you're a Jets fan. fan. <laughs> that is true. Um, but I want to tap into your perspective on struggling football teams, kind of along the same lines as what I asked Tom. Do you see a team that's just underachieving at this point, hasn't found itself yet, or just didn't good enough? Well, I, I, I know we're four games into it, and I'm not sure we know who they are. Uh, have we have an opportunity to see who they are? I mean, Indiana State showed us nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. Notre Dame didn't show us very little other than they're not at Notre Dame's level. You know, Oregon State was a winnable game, but when you fumble and you have the crazy pick six, you put yourself in a hole. And today, I, I just thought, you know, I agree with Tom and probably everybody else, just the lack of offense, mm -hmm. the lack of big plays, mm -hmm. and the lack of – creativity and imagination to me in this game plan today was surprising based on what Walters had said a after the Oregon state loss. Now maybe he, he was all talking about defense, but he said some changes and stuff. I mean, today it just, it, I'll use the word mundane when it comes to their offense. Mm -hmm. It was zone read on first down zone read on second down and let's throw a pass on third down. Was that the game plan? Was that what was signed off on on Monday to, to do that against this team? Nebraska is an improved club. Matt Rule's done a great job getting them out of the basement of the Big Ten. But this wasn't an overwhelming opponent that Purdue right. didn't have a chance to move the ball on. They they did. They had a chance to move the ball. But it just it seemed robotic. It seemed pre-planned. This is what we're going to do regardless of the look that we get. It was only until the final drive when they're playing prevent defense and they rack up a, a bunch of yardage. Penalties hurt, but there were a lot of penalties, you know, I, I, but I'm not going to sit here and say the penalties cost Purdue the game. And there were a lot of them, but I just thought the, the, the really no, no real offensive identity mm -hmm. there that you yeah. were trying yeah. to establish really put Purdue in a hole. Now I think the defense played well enough to give Purdue a chance to win this game. But, you know, when you, when, then when you have the pick six and other things, it's, it's all over. Yeah. I get paid by the word. So I'm just going to talk now. <laughs> um, 
yeah, no, the, the story for me is the offense. It's just, I asked Walters after the game in code, um, what are you trying to do? Like, what, what are you trying to fall back on here? What, what is your thing that you're trying to leverage? Cause you watch the game and you can't really tell. And I know they're down some important guys here, but you don't see a lot of creativity. You don't see, and I, I understand, let me be very clear. Trick plays do not work unless your base stuff works. That's a, a fundamental truth in football, but I, I just didn't see any sort of st strategic mechanisms in place for this specific opponent. I don't see a lot of pressure valve type of stuff where if you can't protect, what are you doing about that schematically? Where, where are the screens? Where's the, the horizontal passing? You know, things like that. Hudson Card made a couple of NFL throws in this game. Hudson mm -hmm. Card for three weeks now, four weeks with the bye, has had no chance. Um, because he's not getting any help. He's got no playmakers around him mm -hmm. except for Max Clare. Um, his offensive line, his protection is not helping him. Devin Mockaby, God bless him. He, that kid's heart is bigger than his body. I, he, he's running really hard, but there's just nothing that puts people off balance. And I think Purdue's got to go back to the drawing board here um, and figure something out that they're good at, that they can execute with the people they have and not go into every game with a game plan that says, well, if we only add CJ Smith and Jamal Edron. Now I'm not saying that Purdue's saying that, but they got to figure something else out here to, to be able to move the sticks because the defense gave you a chance in the first half. If you mm -hmm. could just score, this could have been a different ball game because you had an opportunity to go up 7-0, 10-0, whatever it might've been. And you couldn't do it because you weren't good enough on offense. The defense gave you a chance for the first time in, probably since Indiana State, which shouldn't count because Indiana State was just cashing a paycheck, clearly. But they've got to figure something out here. They've got to get creative. They've got to be pragmatic about this. they got to figure something out, and um, or else this is going to be all season long. Uh, Tom, mm -hmm. what's going on with the protection on offense? Do you think they can give Hudson Card a chance here with the receivers he has uh, at his disposal? You would think. I mean, um, uh, it's uh, they've, they've had a couple of weeks to try to figure this out, Brian. And uh, you saw what I saw today. Uh, um, if the line struggles to protect, and I think, I think that's been clearly established. It's an issue. And let's be frank about this too. Nebraska's defensive front is not the 1975 Pittsburgh Steeler front either. And like I said, five sacks and, and a lot of duress today for Hudson Card. Uh, so yeah, I think like, like you were talking about too, Brian. It's incumbent on some offensive creativity to do some things that would that would compensate for a line that struggles to pass protect as well. So everybody knows the, those issues are going to come after Purdue. They're going to blitz as well. And um, yeah, that, that, that's what the, these the, these coaches are paid for. And you guys talk too about just the lack of playmakers, the lack of explosion, the lack of difference makers today. Yeah, so apparent, guys. The longest run was 13 yards. They didn't have one pass completion over 20 yards and uh, the yak is almost non-existent they never hit any receivers in stride guys are falling down as they're catching the ball or they turn around catch the ball and get tackled uh nothing happens after the catch typically when there are catches made so on and on it goes um it doesn't get any easier from here two guys and you know like you said i thought the defense did play well enough early on first half was zero zero they bowed their back a few times like they did in corvallis last week as well the offense could never really Connect, take advantage of it and get Purdue on the scoreboard. So, you know, here we are. I know, I know the defense isn't without it. it's 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 foibles either. It's just amazing to think, guys. We're four games in and Purdue still doesn't have a takeaway this year. Um, it's really incredible. So, I guess on a positive note, we got to see Spencer Porath, right? He missed his first field goal, but he did hit his second. I think Mike. I heard Mike down the road for me. Purdue had a three nothing lead, and that was her first lead against an FBS foe all year, right? But Mike, that lead didn't last very long, did it? Like uh, three minutes and 56 seconds or two minutes and 56 seconds because uh, <laughs> Nebraska just took it right down and, yeah. and scored again. Uh, to me, the amazing one of the amazing things that you that you hear is that, you know, they haven't had Edron. They haven't had Smith, two guys that have played what a combined game and a half or two games for Purdue. Mm -hmm. Like, why does your offense all of a sudden can't function without those two guys? when you brought in other playmakers from the portal, other playmakers on your team, 
why why is the offense so centered around them to to get you going? And we don't know if those two can get Purdue going because we have not seen, in my opinion, enough of them in a Purdue uniform to understand who they are and what they bring uh, to the table. On a positive note, I think Jerron Tibbs and Leland Smith deserve some credit from this game for making some good contested catches, and that's what you want. You, mm-hmm. I think Max Clare more often than not makes that big play over the middle, which was a unbelievable pass by the quarterback. Mm-hmm. But you just don't see any burst. You don't see any quickness. That's a personnel issue. But when you have personnel issues, it's it's up to the offensive coordinator, the the coaching staff, whoever it might be, to – design some things that can work and uh, you're just you're you're not seeing a whole lot of strategic uh, design here you, you're not seeing a lot of strategic or uh, thoughtful self-aware offense being drawn up and called here and I, that 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 is not a good look for Graham Harrell and um, I don't think I, I need to tell anyone that it's just um, kind of where Purdue is right now um, what else we want to talk about here? You know, from well, I'll, I'll say from an injury standpoint, guys. Um, we saw late in the game, Tyden Jenkins left the field, walked into the locker room. I asked Walters what the issue was there. He said it was a shoulder issue. He didn't think it was going to be anything substantial. Of course, we'll have to stay tuned on that. And uh, CJ Madden, of course, didn't play. It sounds like I think he may be out for the year, from what I'm hearing. Jaden Dixonville didn't play today, so Purdue was down three wide receivers. I think he's got a hamstring issue. I believe, uh, I believe he should be back next week. Um, and again, we saw a little, you know, we talked about wrinkles. What are you doing to try to improve things? We saw a big wrinkle change on defense, right? Mm-hmm. We saw Dylan Thieneman sort of move, swap safety spots where he, he moved up to play more of the safety in the box, where they moved Joe Jefferson back to be that deep safety. That's a spot that Antonio Stevens typically plays, but he was hurt today. So, you know, Walter seemed pleased with that. You know, they kind of got Thieneman closer to the action. He can read things quickly up there. And, uh, again, uh, the, the defense seemed to do pretty well for most of the first half. So that was probably the biggest wrinkle change. And we saw, I think, a decent amount of Jenkins at rush end as well without C.J. Madden is, uh, working out front. So, yeah, again, uh, I, I guess they're searching, looking for answers on defense. And, like I said, here we go, guys, up to Wisconsin. Where, uh, I lost track how many games Peters lost on the road to the Badgers. And, and, uh, and then, like I said, they got to go to Champaign. You know, Brett Bielema was looking his chops there. And then you got that Friday night game, October 18th against Oregon. I mean, the lifting just gets heavier and heavier here. I do want to add something here real quick. It is important we make note of the fact that Purdue does deserve credit for changing on defense and finding yeah. some answers and playing well. The penalties were the game were in large part the story, but to hold Nebraska scoreless in that first half, I know they missed a couple of field goals. I know Purdue blocked a couple of kicks. Mm-hmm. Great. But Purdue did find some answers on defense. Now, where are the answers on offense? That's where Things live yeah. from here. Mike, are there answers? Are the pieces in place right now, in your opinion? Well, I would say no. I mean, based on the evidence, yeah. we've seen the last three games against the competition you need to compete against. So, as you mentioned, you've got to come up with different ways to get whatever playmakers you have on the roster, the ball, and put them in ideal situations. And I, I just – I didn't see that today. And it was – I thought it was striking that – we didn't see that today. We didn't see really anything different. If any, if anything, they went into more of a shell, in my opinion, they didn't, they were not very aggressive in their, in their play calling and trying to pick up, you know, yards and create some big plays. It just seemed very, Mm -hmm. very ordinary. And they looked very ordinary on offense for, for the game. And, I know they scored a touchdown late, but that – I know it counts in the big picture, but you, you were playing a prevent defense and they were, you know, they were not up on you as, as much as they were during the game. So I, I just I – don't, I don't know where they go. I don't know who they turn to. You mentioned a couple guys that could be factors. You know, you, you want to lean on the running game, but mm-hmm. that's been inconsistent this season when you start playing FBS competition. They had a good outing against Oregon State, but really struggled against Notre Dame, and they they struggled again today um, against Notre Dame. And 
uh, an improved running game should help the passing game, should help Card settle down and uh, find some throws and find some players, you know, out in the open. But, you know, until they, you know, look in, inward and try to try to figure out what they can do and what they can't do. And always, you know, you know, we've all dealt with this program when something like this happens, either the offense is hitting on all of its cylinders and the defense is not how much is the head coach at that point involved in what happens on that side of the ball. So the question to me is how much is Ryan Walters involved in what is going on on the offensive side? He's the perfect person to be involved in the offense because his strength is defense Mm -hmm. and trying to help figure out what will work for this offense. So that that's an unknown that we'll probably never, never really know or understand, but you can't go up to Wisconsin and look this ordinary. I don't care what Wisconsin is doing this season. If you look like you did today, you'll get beat again, probably worse. Mm-hmm. And then it'll just, it'll continue on the way. So they got to find some answers on the offensive side and it should be starting right now. I want to mention a sequence. I, I don't have notes. I, I don't have a printed box score. Uh, I think those are extinct. Well, no, I, I left mine no. back there, but the stat pack was the, the big stat packs with the play by play. Um, I've always been a big advocate of not wasting paper. So I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. lamenting the fact I don't have a stat pack. I, I I'm just saying that I don't have this in front of me I'm going from memory and my memory sucks. But um, I think there's a sequence before halftime where it's a zero zero game. You're obviously not going to win this game six to three or three to nothing or something. And <laughs> Purdue takes the ball around midfield ish, maybe. I might be completely misremembering this, but it was a possession where Purdue had respectable field position. And I understand that not every running play is the same, and some are going to work and some aren't. But it, it just seemed like Purdue played that possession like it was up 17 to nothing as opposed to tied 0 0 and needing to do something. It was. It was run, run, and then throw on third down. And um, it just seemed very uh, passive when aggressiveness might have might have mattered. Now, I understand, too, this isn't a video game. Like, you can't just, you know, throw deep is not a solution. But <laughs> you would have liked to have just seen something a little bit more, a little bolder, a little more assertive, uh, and you just didn't. And that gets back to the larger point here about the offense just being very, very mm-hmm. flaccid. And you kind of feel bad about Is that the right word? Flaccid, correct. That's correct usage, sir. I hope it's the right <laughs> context, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> you could have said another word that might have fit. How about toothless? <laughs> How about toothless? <laughs> Um, I mean, but, but right now, I mean, they don't have anybody on offense that scares anybody. They don't have anybody on offense. That's, who do you, if, if you're Wisconsin and you're Illinois, who are you game planning to stop? Max Claire. That's it. And that's it right now. And that's just the reality of it. And that, that was my point that you just reminded me of is the transfers coming into the program that we've seen thus far. Now, we've not seen CJ Smith. Nylon Green still gets an incomplete, he's only played one game. Jamal Edrin, who I guess we could count toward this class, uh, obviously is out right now. But it just doesn't seem like the talent level is better than it was last year. And obviously it's a long season, but not really anymore. Um, Eight games left. You know, has anyone made a difference in this transfer class yet? <clears throat> not really. Not really. I mean, right, like Reggie Love has been good. He's been solid, right? Um, but otherwise, the offensive lineman, they may have a couple of starters, you know, Corey Stewart and DJ Wingfield. Yeah, but starter um, doesn't mean good. Starter I know, but I know. But I, 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 would say, I would say Reggie Love probably yeah. offensively. And defensively, the transfers made the biggest impact, my goodness. I, again, just because he's starting was, was, was Sheeta Soleil. I mean, again, but he hasn't really made an impact. So your, your, your point's taken, Brian. Kendrick Breedlove, the slot cornerback, he's probably played the most, maybe been the most effective of the transfers on defense issue. But you're right. By and large, there's been a group of guys that have had minimal impact in 2024. Mike, how much of this is just a cautionary portal tale where, you know, you bring in all these guys not really knowing what you're getting, 
your expectations as a coaching staff are high coming in because you you like them, but then they get out there and maybe they're not the difference makers that you might have convinced yourself they were or you thought they were. I think every every transfer portal is yeah a risk. It's a coin flip. I mean, it's you know, I think it's worse than a coin flip. I mean, if you look around the country at the programs that do well, and not just national championship level, but just do well, their their foundation is still high school mm-hmm. recruiting. And then you're you're filling pieces with the transfer portal. You're filling a need. But it appears that Purdue is in a different position where they are filling needs, but they're filling a lot of needs. And, you know, part of that is Walters is still – in the young stages of this program, trying to establish recruiting and what he needs from that. But there's so much, I think, pressure now to fill your team with portals because both they have experience and they've maybe they've played. Mm-hmm. You know, they've, you know, I think people get caught up in the brand name where they come from, mm-hmm. and not look at the talent. And I think that that that's a lot of mistakes. You know, in basketball, it's easier if you need a piece in the portal. You know, Painter has done that very well over the last several years. Football is a different animal because you have you have more holes to fill. Mm-hmm. But I think every portal addition is a cautionary tale. Um, you know, Hudson Card, you know, has filled a need, but you know, I just I just don't know if this whole thing is so sustainable that it's going to help a program like Purdue get over the hump on the schedule they have to play every year. And, and all this stuff. I mean, it's your speed dating when you're getting these guys because you have limited time and mm-hmm. that's a byproduct of the calendar, a byproduct of the schedule that you have to turn, the, you have to turn these portal guys around so quickly because you got to get them in school. You got to get them ready for spring ball mm-hmm. that it's just, it is so difficult to really gauge who you have to me. The, if, you know, obviously this is going to continue, but the best way, I can think of is that you go out and get portal guys from players that you previously recruited. You have a foundation of who they are. You have an idea who they are. You understand their values. You understand what they bring to the table instead of just randomly looking through names on a computer and say, well, this guy had five catches for whatever. I mean, it just. Swipe right, swipe right, swipe right. Yeah, I mean, it's just. I, I think that would be my approach if I was in it, and I'm sure some coaches try to do that. But I, I just – right now, there's there hasn't been a big impact Mm-mm. for yeah. Purdue in this case, and a program like Purdue needs transfer portals to have a bigger impact than they're having right now. Maybe at the end of the year we'll say that these five players, six players had an impact, but mm-hmm. right now there's not a big impact coming from the portal uh, right now. I think it's a, a vicious cycle that programs under new staffs or losing programs, whoever it might be, Purdue would obviously be the former, not the latter um, at this point. Uh, it's just a vicious cycle where you lose a ton of guys, you got to replace them, and then you have a lot of one-year guys in there, so then you got to replace them. Mm-hmm. And it's harder to build through the high school ranks nowadays because guys aren't going to stay for – you know what? In It'd been, they, 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 they would have been better off giving Scorton whatever he wanted, regardless of how crazy it was, and then paying two guys from another school the same amount of money. You know, I mean, I, we, Brian's talked about just the money to retain your guys. Guys you already have in the system, pay money to retain the guys you have. Uh, pay Deion Burks what, 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 he, what he wants. Well, uh, good have. Good have. Did they have those resources that, that that is a question. question. Yeah, instead of signing – Two other portal receivers just pulled it along to Deion Burks or something. I don't know. But um, you know, I, I don't know. Did Purdue have the resources to do that? Yeah, again, I, I don't know. But um, boy, you knew what you had in those guys, right? Right. You knew what you had in those guys, and you went out to portal to grab a lot of unknowns and pay them some pretty good cash. So That's I cool. guess you know. And and now pe- teams and coaches are just going to throw more money after average players. And it's just going to be a never-ending cycle yeah. of just 
you know, it's just like a pro sports team that is horrible at the salary cap and they keep throwing bad money after bad players mm -hmm. and you never catch up and you're always in a hole and Purdue's going to have to find a way to keep the players they have, pay the players they have, but also add, add the right players from yeah. the yeah. portal that, that, that are going to help you. Will that NIL money dry up? Because pan, right. fan and donors are disgruntled with the, with the buying decisions of this current coaching staff. Are they going to still sign big checks, not really trusting how these guys spend it? Well, to be fair, I think that when the revenue sharing stuff comes in, this offsets a lot of this parity. Well, I think it's still going to be big. I think NIL will obviously remain in old place. Yeah. People will go back to old school cheating, but I think that the revenue piece of it will help with your attention. It'll help with uh, not having to, you know, be as so cap minded. Um, but we'll obviously see for all we know, the house settlement might blow up and yeah, um, we don't know what this is going to look like, but um, for the time being, it looks like Purdue has not been a winner in the portal cycle. And that that's, that's, I'm not saying that to be, mean to some of these guys pretty sign but I, I just none of them jump out to me as mm -hmm. as guys who are making a huge difference right now and that's fair will continue to make a huge difference mm -hmm. so um all right block kicks anybody have anything to say about block kicks <laughs> first time that that block since that's, 2011. A that's a positive <laughs> I, I know i know they're credited as a block kicks but it, it looked like a golfer out of camp and hitting a a blade runner across across the Bermuda grass. The bad snaps, I think, were a big part yeah, of it. Yeah, they were bad snaps and they were low kicks, but you know, Purdue blocked them and that credit to them. Okay. But um I think you know Purdue took advantage of that, but they didn't fully take advantage of it uh, yeah. from from the other standpoint. You got just, anything you you got anything you want to say about Keelan Kremens, Brian? He's he's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. When did Americans stop hunting? 1978. I, I just, I can't remember the last time. I'm, I'm just kidding, of course. But I don't, I don't see a lot of American punters anymore. <laughs> it's like the punting jobs have all left the U.S. This should be part of the presidential campaign. Yeah, I mean, it should bring be. Punting back, bring punting back. Bring punting back to punting jobs to Americans. To the U.S. One final point for me. Uh, with Joe Shopper will be the last. Will be a, will be a trivia question one day. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, there's another one between. <laughs> I don't was think there another was. American punter. Wasn't there between now and Shopper? A full time one? I don't know. I think I can't. There may have been. I can't remember when Ansel got here. Who punted on the from, yeah. yeah, I can't. I guess he was there today looking all big and buff. I uh, just have one more point to make before we mercifully put this <laughs> simulcast to an end. I just think Purdue, you know, is more competitive than I think it's record. Let me keep word this very carefully because people will be screen capping this and aggregating it. Um, <laughs> I just think Purdue has to figure out how to win. Uh, they got to be better on both sides of the ball. They got to build a momentum defensively, but they also have to get to a place. And Ryan Walters uses the term complimentary football a lot, which is kind of a broad term when you interpret it in a variety of different ways. But to me, that means like, when the defense does something positive, I mean, you always want to score, but you know, sometimes you just need a first down just to keep the game, yeah, you know, kind of under control after the defense gets a stop and you know, field position and things like that. But I just think you know, Purdue had a golden opportunity in the first half when the mm -hmm. defense was playing well, and if the offense had just done anything, you know, this might have ended up being a different game if they could have just stolen a touchdown. Yeah. Had anybody or had any play call that could have made somebody miss a tackle and all of a sudden you get a big play, you turn the field over or you score, this game might have played out differently. And just getting all three phases of the game, you know, synced up to one another. Obviously, I, I'm I'm not being trying to be condescending here about saying that Purdue's not trying to be good on all three phases of the game at the same time. It's just this team doesn't rise to those moments uh yet where yeah. You know, Oregon State was the same way. You had those opportunities offensively, you know, to open the game, and you squandered it. And 
that turnover in the red zone set the set the tone for the whole game. And mm-hmm. I just think Purdue's got to figure out some things to to be more situationally clutch, productive, mm-hmm. whatever term you want to use. So uh, mm-hmm. anything anybody else have anything to add? Mike, how's the press box this late? Mike's afternoon? gonna go get his pizza at Arnie's, I think. No, the press box is <laughs> burn me one. No, the 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 Nebraska media is still hanging around because that's what they do. They do hours and hours of content. Yeah, they're talking about the uh, football game. So making an able I don't know who else is here. So I'm in the Purdue radio booth. All right. And there's some cleanup going on on aisle five behind me. There's somebody back here. Somebody yeah. behind me. Behind me. I got my eye on him for you. I noticed. Um, I got your back. Our, our good friends at Husker Online are probably two stories into the eight. They'll write from the press box. And I, us three chuckleheads are sitting here <laughs> ready to pack it in and watch SNL tonight. Um, <laughs> but they've got a better story to cover than we do right now. So, um, yeah, right. So I, I guess that's what we got. Uh, obviously, a very disappointing performance for Purdue uh, on homecoming uh, on a very dreary sort of afternoon, I thought. Uh, a little bit rainy. A little bit uh, sunny, a little rainy, a little bit of everything. So we're going to wrap this up. This has been your goldenblack.com Saturday simulcast following Purdue's 28 to 10 loss to Nebraska. Thank you so much to the Purdue Union Club Hotel. Mm-hmm. whose logo, unfortunately, we haven't figured out how to block out with my stupid window. Um, we will get that fixed, uh, guys. So sorry about that. Um, if you're Thanks. listening to this on iTunes or whatever, please uh, leave a five-star review if you see fit. If you have nothing positive to say, you can keep that to yourself. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe, leave a comment again. If it's positive, if it's not positive, then keep it to yourself. We don't want to buy your Bitcoin either. So please just, 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 just ignore that. Leave that part out of it. So Mike, Tom, thank you so much. And Alan, we will come for you in the morning. Uh, yes. Go find the biggest, baddest guy you can find in there and punch him. And that will earn you, earn you respect in the can. That's what I've always <laughs> heard anyway. So you got the biggest guy and hit him in the nose. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.